Rosie and Bill Show wish to thank our primary sponsors, The Mallon Agency, located in Springfield, PA, where they take pride in exceeding expectations every time. Anthony DiCecco and our friends at Tennis Addiction are ready to serve all your tennis needs at their beautiful facility in Exton, PA. Welcome everyone to the Rosie and Bill Show. And if you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook so you never miss an episode. Now, folks, our guest this week charted three multi-platinum albums as a singer-songwriter. As a producer, he's been nominated for 10 Grammy Awards, winning four along the way. And back in the 80s, he wrote, co-wrote, and sang lead on some of the biggest hits for the iconic rock group Kansas. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill Show, one of the best voices on the planet, John Elefante. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I don't know about one of the best voices on the planet, but I try. <laughs> well, it's right. definitely right. working, John. And, and one of the things that just absolutely jumped out at us was all of these amazing milestones you've achieved, but in a multitude of different roles. And I have to ask, way back when, when you were playing drums and singing in your family's band, did you ever imagine or dream that any of this was even possible? I dreamed it, but never imagined it would ever happen. Of course I dreamed it. I had my first goal was to play at Disneyland. That was a pinnacle for me. That was a a goal I wanted to meet. And I ended up doing that when I was 14 years old. My next goal is I wanted to play at the Los Angeles Forum. And uh, we didn't play there, but we did four nights at Universal Amphitheater, which, is, which was similar. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I mean... Praise God, I hit a lot of my goals. And, you know, it's not only reaching the goals, it's 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 reaching milestones in your life as well as you go along. So, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs, like everybody. That's how we get strong, right? Yes. But, um, yes, no, I, I, I never dreamed it would happen, but it did. John, a couple of questions. I mean, yeah. your voice is extraordinary. It's powerful. You've got range. When... Did you realize that you had something special and did you have any formal training to cultivate and develop that even more? I can answer both those questions. The first time I knew I had something is when the lead singer of our band, when I was very young, 11, 12 ish, we had a band then, believe it or not, he, he had quit the band and the only likely one to go out front was me. And the only song I knew was I'll Be There by the Jacksons. Hmm. And, I, and I sang it in front of a crowd. I forget where we were. And my mom pushed me. She, she, she was kind of a stage mother, but not. And she said, go sing that song, John. That was your chance. I said, no, Mom, I, I can't do that. She said, just go do it. So the piano player started you know, rattling it off. And I sang I'll Be There. And that's some pretty high notes in that song. And I pulled it off and I got like this standing ovation. I went, wow, they like me as a singer because I was always a drummer. The second part of your question was um, I did have I did have um, some years of operatic vocal training, which has helped me immensely at my age now because I it doesn't so much make you a better singer other than it gave me five notes, six notes on my range. Mm -hmm. So I guess it does make you a better singer when you have that to – you know, that bag of tricks to go into. But um, it helps me where I can sing several nights and not get tired because I know how to sing correctly. Where a lot of singers don't know how to sing correctly and they beat up their voices. And by the time they're my age, they, they're they done. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I will say, John, I'm going to uh, come back to this a little bit later. But one of the things that really fascinates me when I watch you perform is it's just so smooth and so controlled and almost effortless as you're going up the scale, hitting those notes. So I think that that training and that all the years of what you've done really comes through. And like I said, I've got a special question I want to ask you towards the end where I'm going to come back to that with something I've seen you do that I didn't know anybody could do. So there's a little teaser for, for what's to come. <laughs> well, Bill, for I, I, I got chills when he said, that he sang that song, John, when you, you sang the song, you got a standing ovation. I mean, that just, it gave me chills. It was amazing. I'll never forget it. And you said you were about 11 years old. Were you kind of hooked right then and there once you got that ovation? Well, I became the singer in the band after that. So, um, 
Yeah, I guess you could say I was. <laughs> well, speaking of becoming singer in a band, I'm going to fast forward now to early 1980s. I believe it was 1981. Mm -hmm. You competed against some incredibly talented vocalist and became the lead singer of Kansas. So at that point in that career, what did landing that role mean to you? You know, first of all, Bill, I didn't know who I was competing against. Nobody told me. I was competing against nobody for all I knew. Hmm. Wow. Um, I didn't know it was Sammy Hager, and I didn't know it was the guy that played Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, I forget his name. A lot of really great singers. And when I did the audition, I had my brother with me, and the manager and the Ken Scott, a legendary producer, as in David Bowie, Beatles, Super Tramp, is in the control room, and my knees were literally shaking. And I thought I did a horrible job. And I got in the car on the way home with my brother. And he said, you got the gig, man. I said, you're crazy. I said, where, where are you getting that from? He goes, because your voice just fit the music. They knew you were nervous. It didn't matter. They knew your voice was quivering a little bit. I mean, who's wouldn't? And he was right. I mean, a series of events happened after that. I, get, I got calls from the manager and the guys in the band. And I went down to Atlanta and... and they put, they put me in the band, and uh, I guess the rest is history. How do you combat those nerves? I'm just curious because I'm sure that was really nerve-wracking just to get the job. But once you have the job and you're in front of tens of thousands of people, do you get the quivering knees in that situation? I, I did at first, but you're so busy doing your job. You know what I mean? You're so busy at what you've rehearsed, and you know you're now on the big stage, and you can't make a mistake. and sweep it under the rug anymore. You can't stop in the middle of a song and start again like we did in the old days <laughs> when we had our, our cover band, but um, you, you're too busy to think about it. You're just doing your job and you're hitting your notes and you're performing and you're, you know, exciting the crowd. And so after a while, no, it was, it was, it was pretty easy. Wow. Yeah. You get on the roller coaster and you just got to go, right? Exactly. Well, now you brought something up about your brother, okay? Just kind of being there and saying, wow, you nailed it. And you later found another talent of yours, which is working on the other side of the glass. Right. Which is also something you've done with your brother. What has that been like to you to become a producer and to work with Dino? That was never meant to be. Well, I guess it was meant to be. Uh, it was never planned. I never wanted to be a producer. I didn't know how to be a producer. I wanted to, when I left Kansas, I wanted to keep going as an artist. And we certainly, we certainly tried, but we got a call from Bob Hartman and Petra saying, Hey, you know, cause my brother already produced a sweet comfort band. Remember them? He, he produced one of their records. So while I was working with Kansas, he was busy building a, a studio back in Los Alamitos, California. And he started to produce a couple of acts. And then we got a call from Bob Hartman and Petra said, we want you to produce the next Petra record. And I told Dino, I said, I don't know how to produce. I mean, and we met with Bob and he flew out to California. He said, John, I kind of just want you to be a member of the band. That's how I want you to approach this. So that severely helped me. That's that's the role that I took. It's like, I've, just make believe you're in the band. It's before John Schlitt even joined. In fact, we auditioned him as we were doing pre-production. And one thing led to another and the record came out really good, I thought, and they asked to do a second one, and we started getting calls from other people. And then we started a record company. And meanwhile, my solo career is being on, held on the back burner. And a lot of my songs are being put on other people's records. And, you know, all that was happening. And I was always kind of had the question, when's going to be my turn? You know, I mean, I'm supposed to be an artist, I think. This is what I do. What am I doing behind the glass telling other people what to do? But it was rewarding. I mean... I mean, there were a lot of great ministries we got involved with, a lot of great bands, a lot of great people. Um, very rewarding. Um, you know, got the accolades, the Grammy Awards and stuff like that. And, but uh, never my intention to be a producer. It just kind of happened. Right. But, you know, it's interesting that you say that, John, because when you're an artist in, in your heart, it can be difficult to watch other people doing what you were born to do 
very hard. It was very hard. I would, Dina would call me sometimes and just go, man, I, I, you know, I know where your head's going, you know, because especially when somebody, when a band needed a song and I had something, you know, in my back pocket for my solo record and I'd pull it out for the band. Would, oh gosh, I wanted to save that for my solo record, you know, uh, like, like we produced a band, the brave and so many of the songs that were going to go on my record ended up going on their record and they did a great job performing them, but boy, I should, I sure wish I, and Mastodon as well. Mastodon, you know, all those songs were supposed to be on my solo record, almost every single one. Well, John, I think one of the amazing things is if you look at that decade of the 90s, and one of the cool things I loved about your website, and folks, if you haven't been to John's website, check it out, because it, it kind of breaks down decade, decade by decade all of the things you've done. And I remember reading through the 90s. Now, some of the things I knew, some of them were, were new to me as I was reading them, but you mentioned Mastodon, the recording studio in Nashville, record company, your solo album, Defying Gravity, comes out in 99. So technically, that's still in the 90s. So I have one question I have to ask about the 90s. Did you ever sure. sleep? A little bit. <laughs> Not much, because, you know, when you when you finish recording at 2 or 3 in the morning, you can't fall asleep because you got the songs running through your head. And then they're, you know, in the morning, they're still running through your head. You know, whenever I get real involved in, in, in uh, producing records, uh, I can't get the songs out of my head. It's like, I just want to like scrub them out of there so I can get some sleep. But uh, to answer your question, I didn't get a lot of, no, I didn't get a lot of sleep, but I try to get more of these days. <laughs> I imagine it is hard to, to turn your mind off. And you mentioned about having to give up your songs to other groups. Is that though gratifying on some level that the songs are that good? that other bands want to perform them? And are you writing a lot now? And if so, are you hiding some in a nook for yourself? <laughs> I'm not really placing any of my songs on any other records right now. Uh, just concentrating on all my all the songs I'm writing are going on my own solo records. So those days are kind of over. But yes, it, it was gratifying to hear them, you know, with other singers singing them. You know, usually we had you know, really great singers doing them and good bands. So yes, it was gratifying. And I, I, I saw, you know, from a ministry point of view, I saw a lot of great things happen. So it wasn't, it wasn't in jest. It wasn't wasted. And John, that, that's some, one of the things that I wanted to touch on. And that is that we noticed through looking through all the decades of your career, there's, there's kind of two constants that were in place. One was your brother, and the other is your faith. And what is it that, or, you know, your faith and family is so important to you. So can, can you talk to us about that and why faith and family is so important to you? Well, you know, faith is, is number one. And, you know, my trust in Jesus Christ is, I mean, that's paramount. My family is my support system. You know, I've been married 37 years now. It's all good. I got a great wife. Uh, yesterday was her, her birthday. She didn't like it much because I won't tell you how old she turned. <laughs> <laughs> really aging myself, but you know, age happens. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I have a great family, great, great kids. I mean, they had their ups and downs going through high school. You know how that is. You know, we've always, we've always tried to uh, fill them with the promise of Jesus Christ. And just like my song, Pass the Flame, Bill, you've heard that, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, it's, that's, uh, it's, it's, that's autobiographical. I mean, it's, that's how I, that's how we try to raise our family. And, and, you know, my youngest is 21 now, so he's, he's, he's flying the coop and he's doing his own thing. But, uh, yeah, family is very important. And, and not only my family now, but both my parents have passed. And I grew up in a very, very tight, tight family. I mean, I was really, really close with my parents and, you know, I was able to talk to my mom about anything. There were no like doing, you know, running around the block and doing things that she didn't know. She knew everything I did. And that might sound kind of weird to some people, but that's the relationship I had with her. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. 
John, you you talked about uh, your faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anything in your career or even in your life for that matter, but but since we're talking about music, that has tested or challenged that faith? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My own ego. Um, it's probably number one. Um, sometimes you get wrapped up in the cares of the world. Um, and I hate to quote my own songs, but defying gravity that you mentioned, Bill, you know, mm -hmm. when I kneel before you, I'm defying gravity. When I stop giving in to the pull of the world, the pull of the world, the cares of the world could suck you under and you don't even know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you're doing any overt sin or like, you know, messing around with this or that. It, it, it's just, you become complacent. Mm -hmm. And it happens, I think it's happened to all of us from time to time. Sometimes it might be a day or two. Sometimes it can go on for 10 years. And I got caught in a rut before I wrote that record. I was very, I became just kind of numb to my Christianity. And that was a huge challenge to, to, to get out of that mode. But God, God set me back on the right path. Thank, <laughs> thankfully. Thankfully. Yeah, and, you know, speaking of that, uh, John, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had another John join us, John Schlitt, who... I don't know him. With, yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> with, with the And, and this, I'm going to now circle back to something I kind of teased earlier uh, when I talked about something I saw you do vocally that, that blew me away, and it was... Um, I love watching you and the Jay Seculo band. You guys, like... You guys play other people's songs better than they ever did. And with you and John Schlitt trading off on lead vocals, that that is literally the most amazing thing I think I've seen musically, is, is the two of you kind of going back and forth the way you do. And one of the videos I saw that blew me away was you took on Brad Delp and Long Time and, yeah. nailed it and, and did it so effortlessly. And not only in the video, but when you guys – just play it live. I mean, I never thought anybody, how do you get up there where Brad got up there and make it look so easy? I don't know. <laughs> I've always been a Boston fan. Um, by the way, we have a blast doing those gigs. You know, I've known John so long now. We're such close friends, but to answer your question, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just knew that song really well already. I didn't need to study it. I mean, I think I sang it first time around. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good band. I mean, we we rehearse and we try to we try to keep everything to the letter. In fact, Sticks put up um, what's the Sticks song oh, we fooling do? Fooling yourself. Uh, fooling yourself. They put yeah. it up on their on their website. I saw that. Yeah, and and I guess they really liked it, and um, sh you know they showed it off for us. Well, and that's another voice, you know, Dennis, D, whether it's Dennis D. Young or Tommy Shaw doing it again, that's just incredible. Like back in the day, I would sing Come Sail Away and I needed three days to recover. <laughs> yeah, the difference between those guys is the, the vibrato. Sailing yeah. away, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> where Tommy Shaw is much straighter, you know, I studied yes. those guys. They're no, both great absolutely. singers. I've, 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 done, I've done shows with... Uh, with um, Dennis DeYoung. Who are your influences? Man, we'd be here for hours. Uh, I go all the way from when I was when I was real little. I was into the Jacksons. Then I got into Chicago, yeah. and then I got into you know more more of the rock bands. Of course, the Beatles. You know, Led Zeppelin. Yes, Kansas. Boston. Um, I'm a huge Steely Dan fan. I just think that's such brilliant songwriting. It just slays me. Um, and then I'll listen to I'll listen to just uh, smooth jazz. If I'm sitting on the beach, I don't want to hear lyrics. I just want to hear music. Because if I if I and if I listen to the radio, I start analyzing the songs too much, and and that puts me in a work mode. I don't want to do that. I want to just relax and listen to mood music. So I have a playlist on my on my my phone that's just mood music. Um, I just like so much different, uh, uh, you know. So, I mean, I love I love um, I love bluegrass music. Love it. 
Absolutely love it. So anything that's good, I love. I, I have one last question for you, John, and that is with all the things that, that you've accomplished and all the things that you've done, is there anything that you haven't done that you would like to set out to do or any unachieved goals yet at this point in your career? Yeah, I'd like to take that Philadelphia Eagles thing off your wall. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, John. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, like you, took, you, you took A.J. Brown from us. Oh, um, oh yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not a, sorry. <laughs> hey, you know what? I've been watching Jalen Hurts since college. I'm a huge, huge sports fan. And that guy's really good. A.J. Brown, I just wish we still had him. But let me ask, let's get back to your question. Is there anything, ask me again, Bill? Yeah. Anything that you haven't accomplished or any goals that you haven't yet achieved that you'd like to set out to achieve in terms of your career? I just want to, through the music that I do and, and what I get involved with, I want more people to um, either strengthen their faith in Christ, come to Christ, um, you know, lift them up in something that I say or sing. Uh, I want to keep doing that. That's, I guess that's the goal I've had for a long time. And it's, I want to just keep it going. I, I don't know that there's any physical goals. Um, not that it matters, but we just won an Emmy award for the first time. Um, that was kind of cool. Cause I've, I've never won. It was for a song I sang on called people get ready. And it had a lot of different, um, artists singing lines in it. Stevie Wonder was on it. I think it was Gladys Knight. And um, it was getting played a lot on a TV show and it won a daytime Emmy. Wow. And uh, it was uh, the guy's name that put it together, um, Skip Martin, good friend of mine. But, you know, that's just, a, that's just a trophy, man. You know, I mean, I look at it and it's fun to look at and it's fun to show your friends, you know, ooh, ah, he's got an Emmy. But, yeah, the goal the goal of talking about Christ and helping people in their walk if 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 one of my songs does that, that's what's truly important to me. Well, you know, it could be Christ saying, Hey, here's just a little reminder that you're on the right path. Here's the Emmy. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's good. <laughs> that's I'll you use know, that. Why no, not? You're right. right? You're you're right. It's it's just yeah, you're right. So and somebody well, else told me that. Somebody else told me. Somebody else told me that once, too. It's like, you know, Grammy Awards. I mean, I, I saw that Sting said in an interview I watched the other day that he keeps him in the bathroom. He keeps his Grammys in the bathroom. So when people are in his in the bathroom, they could see his Grammy Awards. And it just shows that they don't mean that much to him. But hmm. I like your definition. Yeah, it's a, a validation of uh, you using your God-given talent talents that that he sent you here to use that's the way i look at it you know but if you don't happen to be someone who wins it doesn't it doesn't make what you're doing any less valid no not at all so well congratulations on everything you've got going and we look forward to hearing your next solo album with all the songs that you're writing for yourself and we you know definitely love your voice and are glad that you're still doing what what you're you know given to do well thank you very much i i, I know you hear this a lot but i i i have definitely been blessed in a lot of areas and i've had my ups and downs like i said in the beginning of the interview like everyone else but you keep going right you know if you let that stop you and you step aside from the from the path you're worthless that's true. Yeah, we do have to soldier on. Well, yeah. John, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. We really enjoyed it. And folks, we hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll see you next week. Go Titans. <laughs> Go birds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. God bless. God bless. This week's episode has been brought to you by Doherty & Company Insurance Services for all your business and personal insurance needs. Our friends at Tennis Addiction in Exton, PA. And the Mallon Agency, where exceeding expectations is how they do business. Interested in becoming a partner in positivity? Send us an email, rosieandbillshow2018 at gmail.com.